ancient hero reawakened to fight monsters from humanity's distant past who now threaten the modern world. It sounds like a pretty box-standard superhero story nowadays, but things were a little bit different back in 2000. It had been over 10 years since the last full-length Kamen Rider season with Black RX. I mean, there were a few movies with the original Shin Kamen Rider, uh, the one not directed by Hideaki Anno, if you're confused, then Kamen Rider ZO and J afterwards. But there wasn't any real presence for Kamen Rider on television between the years of 1989 and 2000. For Toei, the franchise at that time just wasn't seen as profitable. It's a story many iconic Japanese characters have gone through, but things changed near the turn of the century. Okay, so this is about to get weird, so I need you to stick with me here. See, back in the late 90s, Sega was attempting to market their new console, the Sega Saturn, and to be honest, things weren't looking so hot for them, so they came up with a brilliant marketing idea. Threaten the ever-loving shit out of their consumers. They created Sega Tashanshiro, a martial artist who had an unhealthy obsession with the console and would beat the shit out of you if you didn't own one. And who better to play him than the man who had been beating people up on TV for decades? They got Hiroshi Fujioka, who was best known for playing Takeshi Hongo or Kamen Rider Ichigo in the original series. This marketing campaign was a massive success and catapulted Hiroshi Fujioka back to the top of Japanese public consciousness. And thus, with his renewed popularity, the popularity of his previous work got renewed as well. And thus, old Kamen Rider toys began to fly off the shelves. And so, in the wake of this, Toei decided it was finally time to reintroduce the world to our favorite masked rider. No, not that one. Kamen Rider Kuko would begin airing on January 30th of 2000, running until January 21st of the following year. Primarily written by Naruhisa Arakawa, who'd previously only written one episode of the original Kamen Rider Black, along with the famous, or infamous, depending on who you ask, Toshiki Inoue, who is very, very well known in the Kamen Rider community, most notably for being the main writer on some of the most contentious seasons, which are also some of my least favorite ones, being Agito, Fais, and Kiva. He's also well known for, quote, ruining the second half of Kibiki. I quote there because I haven't watched Hibiki yet, but from what I've heard, I have little doubt I'm going to be in that camp as well. But to be fair, Toshiki Inoue has probably wrote the most Kamen Rider episodes for any single writer in the Heisei era, working on most of Phase 1 and select series in Phase 2. Kuga's main composer was Toshihiko Sahashi, who later went on to compose for Agito, Hibiki, Deno, Gio, and Geats. He's also responsible for composing Kuga's opening and ending themes, Kamen Rider Kuga and Aozora Ni Naru, which are both some of my favorite songs in this series, but we'll dive deeper into the music later. The series was extremely successful in comparison to its general budget, which was considered small even by the standards of the time. In truth, the series wasn't even planned to be a Kamen Rider series. It was only through the continued insistence and excitement of Takeyuki Suzuki, an official with Toei at the time, that the series became a Kamen Rider season in the first place. But thanks to the success the series found, the franchise was greenlit for another season to come after, and the rest is history. Okay, so, I know I said I wouldn't be giving you a play-by-play, -play, but I'm breaking that rule for the first episodes of each series, as they are, in my opinion, the most important ones in the show. As the tone, characters, and visual and auditory style of the show all starts here in the first episode. So, let's get started with episode one. Revival. The show begins with a shot of an ancient warrior fighting against some kind of monster. We see the same warrior again inside of a tomb. A slab of stone is placed over him and we see a strange symbol on it as a hand brushes over the coffin. Cut to an indeterminate amount of time later in the modern day, or as modern as a 24-year-old show can be, we see a group of archaeologists placing their hands over the coffin. After inspecting it for a moment, they decide to open it, finding a mummified corpse inside. One of the researchers states that the corpse doesn't match any known burial practices for ancient cultures in the area, and as the camera pans downwards, we see a strange belt on the corpse's waist. The lead researcher tells everyone to get back to work, and the group disperses as the camera pans to the corpse's hand as it begins to twitch. We're then introduced to our main character, Yusuke Godai, played by actor Joe Odagiri, who we will talk about a lot later. We see Yusuke attempt to comfort a lost child at an airport via his juggling prowess, and much to surprise, it somehow seems to work. After the child is reunited with his parents, Yusuke takes off, and we see our next addition to the main cast, Sakurako Sawatari, another researcher who's investigating the ruins seen in the opening scene. As she answers the phone, we see a figure climbing up the side of the building and sneaking into the window, which turns out to just be Yusuke playing a prank on her. One Sakurako completely no-sells, as this seems to be a stunt Yusuke is prone to pulling. And it definitely is throughout the series that man climbs through more windows than walks through doors. 
It really isn't explained deeply in the show, but Yusuke and Sakurako are very good friends and seems to have known each other for a long time before the beginning of the show. As the two are talking, Sakurako walks over to a computer she was using to find translation for the strange symbols found on the coffin in the ruins. As the translation finishes, she finds that the symbols stand for death and warning. She says that she should let the excavation team know as it should make for good conversation, and I'm sure it'll make for a great conversation piece at their funerals as the next shot we see is of the excavation team and their equipment going haywire. We see a shot from the perspective of something walking towards the researchers huddling in a corner. One of them is frantically calling the police and we see a hand pressed to the face of one of the researchers. Right before we cut to a fallen camera on the floor and the screams of the researchers fill the background. We cut back to Sakurako and Yusuke, the latter on the phone attempting to contact the excavation team as Yusuke is already out the door saying that he's going to go check on them in person. As Yusuke drives through the pouring rain he sees a large beam of light come from the site as we cut and see a shadowy figure stalking through the forest. It stops and seems to shoot some kind of energy from its hands into the ground as we see countless hands begin to claw their way out from underneath the earth. Yusuke arrives to the site that morning to see that the police have already arrived and are investigating the site. He attempts to sneak in via the age-old trick of just pretending he's supposed to be there, but is caught by the third member of our main trio, Kaoru Ichijo, a police detective. Yusuke is questioned for a moment before handing his business card to Ichijo, which labels him as a professional dream chaser and the man of 1,999 skills. Ichijo orders him detained for the moment as Yusuke uses the classic look over there trick to escape the grip of the officer and attempts to run inside of the ruins, only to be once again blocked by Ichijo who trips him and then proceeds to catch him before falling, earning Ichijo a thumbs up from Yusuke before threatening him with arrest if he continues to obstruct the investigation. As Yusuke leaves, he sees another officer run past him carrying the belt we saw on the waist of the corpse from the tomb. Yusuke looks at it for a moment, seeing a vision of the warrior from the beginning of the episode. We then cut to the police station where Yusuke and Sakurako have been asked in for questioning, as they had connections to the excavation team who were found dead by the time the police arrived on site. The two are shown a tape which is stated to be the only thing left intact from the site. The tape shows flashes of the excavation team running from some shadowed figure as the team screams in the background. The figure seems to hold up the belt as it says Kuga before throwing it to the floor and charging the camera. We hear the team calling for someone to come and save them before the screaming continues, only to be cut out shortly before the tape turns to pure static. Yusuke and Sakurako are left to investigate the belt left behind as Ichijo is called away to deal with another incident. We cut to a group of police squad cars outside of a building that's been covered in a massive spider web. The police investigate for a few moments before they're attacked via the power of terrible CGI by a humanoid monster. And quick break here to note an interesting fact, the footage and subtitles I'm using for this review also subtitle the language of the monsters. But in the original Japanese version, as well as many versions of the subtitles, their language is not translated, as the language spoken by these characters is entirely made up for the series. So at the time of release, not even the Japanese viewers had any idea what the fuck these things were saying. At the same time, Yusuke and Sakuraka are leaving the police station with the belt as they discuss deciphering the symbols on the belt as well. Right as a police car seen in the sight of the attack drives through the front doors of the station with the spider-like monster in tow. The monster catches sight of the belt that fell to the ground in the commotion and once again uses the name Kuga to refer to it. The belt begins to glow as Yusuke once again sees a vision of the ancient warrior. The monster begins attacking the nearby police officers as the sound of the chaos fades out as we hear Yusuke's heartbeat instead. As the heartbeat reaches its peak, the monster goes to strike at Yusuke who rolls out of the way, picking up the belt in the process. He puts it on, believing that it must be some kind of weapon used to combat these monsters. And as he does, the belt begins to glow again, this time encompassing the entire room in a bright light. As it fades, we see Yusuke wincing in pain as the belt begins to fuse with his body and in a few short moments the belt has disappeared completely, leaving only a hole in Yusuke's clothing where it once was and a red line all across his waist. The spider monster once again attacks him, throwing him outside, and while he's still recovering from the pain, he has a few moments of getting his ass handed to him. Get used to that, it'll be happening a lot. But in desperation, believing he's going to die, Yusuke throws a punch at the monster, and as he does so, his arm transforms, covering it in a black, white, and gold armor. Yusuke stands, punches again, this time covering his other arm in the same armor. He begins to kick and punch at the monster continuously, each strike transforming him further and further into this new form, via the power of 2000 CGI. And as the transformation completes, the belt once again appears on Yusuke's waist, the newfound strength behind his strikes forcing the monster to its knees as we pull back and see Yusuke in his transformed form for the first time. The shock of the transformation causing him to fall to his knees as the monster recovers, now referring to Yusuke as Kuga, and he continues to fight. The fight is hard, and it's clear that the spider monster completely outclasses Yusuke in both power and skill, 
but as the monster has Yusuke pinned, Ichijo arrives via helicopter and begins to shoot at them both, not knowing that Yusuke is Kuga. The spider monster is distracted as it attempts to climb up to the helicopter, giving Yusuke time to recover. The two of them battle in the helicopter as the monster continues to attempt to kill Ichijo until Yusuke finally kicks it from the helicopter and down through the roof of the building. Yusuke hops back up into the helicopter where Ichijo asks him if he intended to save him. Yusuke simply responds with a thumbs up. But before Ichijo can ask who he is, Yusuke drops from the helicopter, safely landing on the roof of a nearby building. From the thumbs up, Ichijo quickly puts the pieces together as we end the episode looking out over the setting sun as Kuga's theme plays in the background.